Well, hello, everyone. I cannot think of a better place to preach my last sermon before sabbatical than my living room. So welcome. Thanks for coming over, everyone. Actually, I feel like God's playing a little bit of a joke on me. As I was preparing the framework for this sabbatical, I consulted with a friend of mine who does this kind of thing for a living. And she recommended that I start to slow down a week or two before my break. And of course, I did what I always do when I get information like that. I just try to brush it off. And I said, no, forget about it. I'm going to work hard until the end, 11.59 p.m. on February the 28th, because i got to get it all done. And then I received a call from the health authority saying that I needed to quarantine at home for a week. Funny, right? Anyway... The week went from absolutely full to nearly empty. And I took the disruption as God gently saying to me, you know your friend? And she was actually right about that slowing down bit. And uh, you're not paying attention, so maybe I can help you with that. So I'm going to share a little bit more about my sabbatical towards the end of this message. Uh, But Before we get to that, let's round up the last few pieces of Ecclesiastes by remembering where we've been so far. So follow along with me on this fancy chart that I just made. The premise, thesis, worldview, guiding idea, whatever you want to call it that Ecclesiastes begins with is this. Everything is Hevel. That is, life is nothing more than vapor or steam. It's futile and brief. And if you dwell on that idea long enough, you'll recognize that life is absurd and incomprehensible. And if you sit with that idea, as long as our author has, you may end up with the same place or in the same place he finds himself by assessing all of life and saying that all of it is meaningless. So our author then takes that idea and filters it through three themes over and over again through the book. And they are time. What's time? It comes and goes no matter what you do. Death, you're going to die, so deal with it. And then finally, chance. Everything you do, no matter how hard or how little you try, will be greatly impacted by the things that are completely out of your control, which is likely the root cause of all of our anxiety when it comes to life, time, death, and chance. We want to control it all, but we can't. So where does this leave us? What does that all mean? And what is the point of this book? And why is it in the Bible in the first place? Well, we will take a look at that today, but we're going to start our tour with looking at the big ideas of chapters 10, 11, and 12 of Ecclesiastes. And by the end, we'll fill in that last part of the outline that I just showed you and answer the question, well, What does any of this have anything to do with me? All right, let's get moving. The words of a wise person are gracious. The talk of a fool self-destructs. He starts out talking nonsense and ends up spouting insanity and evil. Fools talk way too much, chattering stuff they know nothing about. Don't badmouth your leaders, not even under your breath. And don't abuse your betters, even in the privacy of your home. Loose talk has a way of getting picked up and spread around. Little birds drop the crumbs of your gossip far and wide. So why this little interlude about gossip and idle words in a book that is desperate to uncover the meaning of life? Well, I think the two are actually connected. Think about the chatter or the small talk or the hushed conversations that you've been a part of, like I have been a part of, when you question or disapprove of someone else's actions. You've been in those moments, right? People start whispering and talking, then we start making assumptions, and then we start guessing, and then we start to try to sort of Sherlock Holmes it and solve the mystery as to why people are doing all those things that we don't like. Perhaps what that actually is is just another faulty attempt to control the people and situations in our lives. And according to Ecclesiastes, that kind of chatter is deadly. 
from the version of the Bible that I just read from, the translators take verse 12 to say, the talk of fools self-destructs. Your Bible might translate that line as, a fool's lips are his undoing. Now, these are nicely cleaned up English versions for easy reading for people like you and me. But the Hebrew text literally reads, the fool's lips will devour him. So I feel like cannibalism is a harsh metaphor for destruction, but that's how serious this connection between gossip and the meaning of life is. So for you and I, when we observe people whose actions take us back, or when we're trying to figure out if someone is good or bad, or when we're not quite sure that our friends, you know, what they're up to, uh, but we have very strong opinions about what they're up to and we're very willing to share those opinions, even if nobody is asking, right there, that right there is the danger zone. When we diminish people and their lives to cold, stark categories like right and wrong, black and white, in or out, we devour ourselves. But not only that, we also insult whatever work is currently in progress by God's Spirit in the life of the person that you're looking down your nose at. At what point did we decide that it was our right to know everything about everything and about everyone? And who decided on these stark siloed categories. Could it be possible that God's spirit is beyond our comprehension and beyond our categories? Maybe think about it like this. The wise 20th century theologian Forrest Gump once put it like this. I don't know if we each have a destiny or if we're all just floating around accident alike on a breeze, but I think maybe it's both. Maybe both are happening at the exact same time. Hmm. I wonder if Forrest was reading Ecclesiastes when he said that, because it really captures the vibe of this book. And I think it presents us with a question that we need to deal with. And it's this, are you okay with no answers? Are you? Am I? Whether it's about God or other people or life, as Christians, we must recognize that we don't live in a black and white, either or kind of a world. Opposing paradoxical things are both happening at the exact same time, meaning that someone's life could be imploding, and that's exactly what God needs to get in there. Or perhaps someone is genuinely trying to live life in the way of Jesus and at the same time is making terrible life decisions. Is it possible that these two things could be happening at the exact same time? Of course. I once complained actually to my spiritual director that I didn't know where God was leading me in a particular situation in my life where next steps were once very easy and clear for me. After hearing this, she looked me straight in the eyes, and then she says this. You ready for this? She says, good. Maybe now you'll have to live by faith for once. That hurt. But she was right. I'm now learning to be okay without having all of the answers. But I'm not sure if I'm totally ready for what that entails. And that's exactly where Ecclesiastes brings us next. Be generous. Invest in acts of charity. Charity yields high returns. Don't hoard your goods. Spread them around. Be a blessing to others. This could be your last night. Just as you'll never understand the mystery of life forming in a pregnant woman, so you'll never understand the mystery at work in all that God does. Go to work in the morning and stick to it until evening without watching the clock. You never know from moment to moment how your work will turn out in the end. There it is, that last line. If you 
are like me, that last line does not compute. If I'm going to do something, it had better work out. If I invest my time, my money, my effort into something, there better be some kind of payoff. Sadly, I think my kids have picked up a little of this from me. And if you're a parent, maybe you've noticed the same thing. If something doesn't turn out perfectly on the first try, kids usually just give up. It's not worth it. They don't want to do it anymore. But here's the thing. For Christians, that is not our approach. Let me see if I can explain that to you by making another connection. A connection between Detroit, Japan, and then right back around to you and me right here in Saskatoon. Let's start with this story out of Detroit. As a journalist and Detroit native, Aaron Foley is tired of the two dominant portrayals of his hometown. One is about poverty, crime, and ruins of the great city that was. The other is about newcomers launching coffee shops and hipster bars, mostly downtown. So last year, when Mayor Mike Duggan approached Foley about shaping a new narrative focused around the spirit of the people living and working in Detroit's neighborhoods, he jumped at the chance. Foley became Detroit's first chief storyteller, an unusual title for a job in local government. Foley shines a light on artists, small business owners, doctors, nonprofit groups, and many others who each, in their own way, are making Detroit a little bit stronger. He's particularly focused on telling stories from African American, LGBT, and immigrant communities, stories he says aren't always reflected in mainstream media. It's a new model of civic engagement, it's very experimental. We don't have all the answers, and to be honest, I'm not sure if we're doing everything the right way because we have no benchmark to go off of. But by my calculations, it seems to be working. Did you catch all of that? They're trying something new, something experimental. They don't have all the answers or a playbook, and it seems like it's working, maybe? So Detroit is trying to address a big, old, common problem with an approach that has zero guarantees. They're investing time, resources, political chips. Could you imagine if Saskatoon tried to pull one of those? And you name it, on something, something that really has a great chance of failing. Now, keep that in mind as we make a connection to Japan. Check out this story. In a bid to tackle the rise in suicide rates for the first time in 11 years due to the coronavirus crisis, Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga has appointed Tetsushi Sakamoto as its first ever Minister for Loneliness. Besides this, Sakamoto is also in charge of managing the nation's falling birth rate and strengthening regional economies. Following Britain's leads, Japanese government created an isolation loneliness countermeasures office in its cabinet on February 19th to counter issues like suicide and child poverty. Sakamoto said in his inaugural press conference, Prime Minister Suga had appointed him to address matters of national importance, including the issue of increasing women's suicide rate under the pandemic. He added, Suga instructed me to examine the issue and put forward a comprehensive strategy by coordinating with the related ministry. I hope to carry out activities to prevent social loneliness and isolation and to protect ties between people. I hope, he says, I hope that I can crack the code to prevent loneliness and isolation in Japan. If Detroit is dealing with a big, wide, old problem, then Japan is addressing a very specific and unique new problem. And the person in charge says, I hope we can do this. What else is he supposed to say? And it's at that intersection of Detroit's, I don't know how to do this, and Japan's, I hope we can do this, that Ecclesiastes presses the point for you and I by reminding us of the section that we read earlier, where it said, you don't know how pregnancy works. 
You don't know how God works. What do you know? You don't know what your work will accomplish. And it's not your job to know. And that for me is is the gem in this passage. Because as Christians, our end goal is not guarantees or success or even productivity. As followers of Jesus, our goal isn't to get stuff done. The goal instead is to be obedient to whatever it is that God is drawing you towards. And if you don't have all the answers, and if you can only hope that things will work out, then in the words of my spiritual director, good, maybe now you'll finally have to live by faith for once. So maybe the hard question for us here is this. Are you able to be obedient to God even if that obedience does not produce your intended results. I'll be honest with you here. I've been working on that one for about 25 years now. But be encouraged, my friends. It is okay to say, I don't know. It is okay to not have a perfect plan. It is even okay if your efforts result in failure. Because again, for the follower of Jesus, the goal is not to succeed, but to be obedient to God, especially with those things that we don't fully understand. Yeah, yeah, it, it's hard, right? But I think it's also a relief, or we could even see it as a gift. Because when you can't fully comprehend or control something, it puts you into a position where you're finally ready, finally open to being surprised. And that's where this book finally arrives. The words of the wise prod us to live well. They're like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God, the one shepherd. But regarding anything beyond this, dear friend, go easy. There's no end to the publishing of books and constant study wears you out so you're no good for anything else. The last and final word is this. Revere God. Do what God tells you. And that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it is good or evil. I like my life buttoned up and screw down tight. I like things neat and in order. And I want there to be a rational reason behind everything that I do. Everything clearly defined and in its place. Which is great when you're organizing a closet, but it's terrible when you want to create that fertile ground in your soul for God to speak and lead and make himself known. And that has squarely been on my mind as I set out on this three-month sabbatical. I have done everything that I can do to prepare. I've had many conversations, I've made arrangements, the books I want to read are neatly stacked on my desk and ready to go. And that's as far as I can take it. And now, now I'm ready to be surprised. I'm ready to be surprised by something that I can't control or I can't screw down tight. I'm ready for God to do something that I can't plan for or arrange or coordinate. I am ready for something that is so beyond me. I'm ready to be surprised. And I really, really want to be. And I hope and pray the same thing for you. For those of you that need a surprise, for those of you that are due for a miracle, for those of you who are finally ready for Jesus to take the wheel, I'll pray that for you while I'm away. Will you pray that for me? And maybe we can also exchange prayers asking God to clear the havel, the meaningless list of life that we see at the end of Ecclesiastes. The last section of the last chapter of this book brings somewhat of a resolve 
And we can distill it all down to this. Life has meaning, even if you can't make sense of it. And that, my friends, is where this book leaves us. You don't have all the answers. You have no guarantee that your efforts will produce successful results. But your life has meaning. And even if you can't make sense of it, God will. So can you live the questions? Can you live with unresolved tension? Or maybe the more important question is, how do we live the questions? How do we live in ways that bring life and sustain life when we feel like there's no meaning or when it feels like our best efforts aren't worth it? We feel this so keenly in our lives right now. We feel the tension that a global pandemic brings to our personal lives, to our communal lives, to our societal lives. We hold tension everywhere. In our own homes, we may have had to navigate differences of opinion or differences in what is important to focus on during this time. And likely in those discussions, there isn't even a right or wrong answer. We're just learning to negotiate where each person's fear perches and how to honor one another well, while we also stay well physically, mentally, and emotionally. We've seen this in our economy. Closing things down means losses of jobs and business, but keeping things open potentially spreads the virus. Both things are true, and we have to make decisions in the middle of that tension. In our church life, what does it mean with each ebb and flow of the virus to embody together the love of God for the sake of the world? Does it mean we meet together? Does it mean we press pause? And how as individuals and families, do we stay connected while honoring the boundaries of our own lives? What do we do when we have to hold tension that doesn't resolve or live with questions that don't have answers? Well, first off, I would say that we need to recognize this as part of the human condition. This territory is part of the journey of life. Even though the writer of Ecclesiastes wasn't living through a pandemic, he was well aware of how reality can create feelings of meaninglessness or hopelessness when it doesn't fit into a neat and tidy little box. He knew that life was full of tension and that sometimes there's just no use in trying to make a straight line out of the curves and spirals that the road of life takes us on. So the scriptures make room for questions, the scriptures make room for tensions, but how do we do this in our own lives? How do we live in tension and not rush to resolution or hopelessness when resolution can't be found? This week, I listened to a podcast with Parker Palmer. He's a Quaker writer who has had several bouts with deep depression, and he shared the story that when he was in the midst of one of these bouts, a friend came every day to rub his feet, and it was really the only thing that reached into the darkness and met him in the middle of that darkness. It was the thing that kept him tethered to reality. It reminded me of a time when my family was going through a very difficult season, and one of my sons and I would sit and watch The Lord of the Rings every night while I would rub his feet. We were living through a time of questions with no resolution. It was a time that we had to journey through. But that simple way of connecting was a way that we lived through the tension and a way that we put one foot in front of the other. So if you are living with tension in your home right now because there's a situation that can't be resolved, maybe a question you could ask yourself is, Whose feet can I rub or how can I connect with the people who are living in the middle of the questions with me right now? Side note, connecting with the people with whom you are in close quarters might require you getting away from them for a little while and that's okay too. Maybe you're feeling tension with your partner or your children right now that just can't seem to be resolved. Your spouse is in your space all the time. Your kids are always there and need to be wrangled constantly. Or maybe there's a topic or an issue that just keeps coming up that you can't seem to convince or control your way out of. 
and you're just not sure everything is going to be okay. Instead of making your connection with others dependent or contingent on the resolution of whatever thing it is that you're experiencing tension in, find ways to connect that aren't about bringing resolution. Set aside intentional time to rub the feet of those you love. What do your children love to do? Do they love watching sports? Watch sports with them. Do they love playing video games? Learn to play video games. Do they love board games or crafts or puzzles or Legos? Do those things with them. Sometimes I have found the way of holding tension is actually by going into the middle of and embracing the thing that is causing the tension. So for instance, I often worry about the amount of time that my kids are spending on screens. That's a legitimate worry and something I should be thinking through, but it also is a way of connecting with them. So one of my kids loves watching movies, and while that is not my jam, I have found that watching movies with him, connecting with him and having conversations about the movies he loves, or learning about the producers and directors that he is watching right now, is a way of creating connection to him. Or if your spouse is working from home, I wonder if a way that you could enter the tension that that creates is by carving out time where you could just sit down together, have a cup of coffee, or do something that you enjoy doing together. Something that you couldn't do when they were working outside of the home or you were. You cannot do anything to resolve the tensions that COVID brings our way. You have absolutely no control over any of that, but you do have the power to make a difference in the lives of the people closest to you in this season. What if the tension that you feel is not necessarily between you and someone in your home, or maybe you live alone? Maybe the tension or the questions you have are within yourself. And maybe um, COVID is compounding feelings of loneliness or sadness or meaninglessness that you've had already. The story of Parker Palmer reminds us that one thing that depression deprives us of is connection with the world. In order to live sustainable lives, we need to feel tethered to reality, to what is going on around us. And so a good practice for helping us through these times is to find ways to connect to the world through our five senses. Listen to music that you love or enjoy the silence. Make food that you enjoy that smells and tastes good. Go outside and listen to the birds or feel the sun on your face. Engage the world of the five senses. And if you're a creative person, make art. I've noticed that the times in my life that have involved the most struggle have also been times of great creativity. So if you're a writer, write. If you draw, draw. If you sing, make music. If you paint, paint. Make something that is beautiful. I know some of y'all are out there knitting and crafting and learning to build things and soon we're going to be able to plant gardens. Keep it up. Do things that create beauty in your life and in the lives of others. If you're not an artist, another idea is for you to read and embed yourself into stories that are not about crushing life because nobody is crushing life right now and thinking that crushing life is the goal does not help us actually live with the questions. So for instance, right now we're in a time of Lent. And Lent is the journey through the wilderness. It is this recognition that we need God, that we are unable to answer our own questions, that we cannot control our own lives. So maybe part of your practice is remembering that Lent is part of the story. Find verses and stories in scripture that help you understand the reality that life is hard, but also that God is good. Both things are true. The story of creation is the story of God creating the world out of chaos, out of nothing, with just the words of God's mouth. The story of Abraham is the story of God calling a nobody and making promises that are impossible to him. The story of Hagar is the story of an Arab woman who was sent out into the desert, abandoned by Abraham. She's hiding in a sand dune, waiting for her son to die of thirst. When God talks to her 
and she becomes in the first person in the Bible to name God. It's a remarkable story. These are three stories that are in the first 14 chapters of the Bible. So there are lots of stories in the Bible, and you can find one that will help you hold the story of your life right now. I promise. Resist stories that tell you that struggle is not a part of the Christian life. It is. There are unanswered prayers and disappointments and failures, and these are all a part of our becoming. They are all part of our spiritual formation when we open them up to God. These struggles are fertile ground for grace. Your final practice is to pray. Praying is one of the best ways that we can live with unanswered questions. Hold your own unanswered questions and emotions before God in prayer, those uncomfortable emotions. If you feel like you have more grief and sadness than you can handle these days, maybe you need to set aside a time when you let yourself grieve your losses each day, when you let the pressure off a little bit. And if you need help putting words to your feelings, go to the Psalms. There are so many prayers of lament and sadness in those passages, and they can help you search for your own words as you learn to pray your own experience. Keep praying for others. Many of us are carrying a heavy load right now, and we need the prayers of one another to help us carry on. Help hold the cares and worries and grief of one another by committing to praying for one another. So if we were to think of our Christian life as a road that we walk, a pilgrimage, a journey, there are times when there are people in our cohort who need us to carry their backpacks for them, who need our help. Prayer is a way that we can help shoulder the load when we also don't have answers to the questions or solutions to offer. We're still in Lent, and this is a timely practice for Lent. Lent is about waiting, it's about preparing, it's about making room for God. It is not a time to come to resolutions. Lent is the time, the space and time when we trust that when things are not resolved, God is still at work in us and among us. God is forming us in our waiting, in our journey, as we hold the tension of unanswered questions and unresolved issues.